hook myself up. Right, hello. Uh, my name is Ted. You will find me online in most places as uh, Drenmi. Uh, I will try not to overshoot by too much. Uh, so, for one, I'm a Rubocop core team member. We're currently in the works of releasing Rubocop 1.0 and we're looking for new contributors. So, if you can code, that's great. If you cannot, that's also great. Uh, we're looking for people to help out with everything from fixing bugs to uh, creating new cops, triaging issues and uh, improving the documentation. Uh, so if you're keen, you can come and talk to me after the presentation or you can ping me on the Ruby SG Slack group. And if you're not in the Ruby SG Slack group, you can go to ruby.sg and invite yourselves. Uh, when I'm not working on Rubocop, which is most of the time, uh, I am the VP of Engineering in a company called Engage Rocket. Uh, we build software for HR professionals. Uh, our office is in uh, Block 71. Uh, and we're also hiring for all levels, uh, interns, juniors, senior developers. Uh, so if you're interested in the challenges uh, that I will be talking about in this presentation, you can come and talk to me or you can ping me on Slack. So to frame the discussion and provide some context for this talk, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce you to the challenges and constraints that we have in Engage Rocket, uh, building HR software. So for our Rails application, like for most, the technical complexity is not really that high. Uh, the HR space is not very technically sophisticated yet. Uh, but we do have to deal with a high level of information complexity. So the keyword for us is feedback analytics. We take a lot of structured and unstructured feedback from employees uh, and we try to present this to HR professionals in ways that are understandable and actionable for them. And although that concept sounds uh, rather simple, taking uh, a lot of data and presenting it to someone, uh, it's not always an easy task and our biggest challenge is dealing with the sometimes overwhelming uh, information complexity, trying to choose the right uh, abstractions and still being able to ship features. So how are we accomplishing this? Uh, part of that question I hope to answer in this talk which I named Mind Your Model. And I talk a lot about modeling in this talk, but it's worth, worth mentioning that the first part, which is the mind, is uh, at least or more important than the model. Uh, we need to be mindful in order to mind our model. So what do I mean when I say the model? Uh, to explain that, I will show you a small illustration of how I like to think about our code base in Engage Rocket. Uh, so at the heart of our application, we have our data model, and these are essentially all our records that are backed by a database. Uh, outside that, we have the extended domain model. Uh, this contains some records, which are uh, things like null objects with static attributes, uh, or records that are aggregates that pull their data from uh, uh, the collections from the data uh, model. And that represents sort of the inert domain model. It doesn't really do anything, it just sits there waiting to be acted upon. Outside that, we have our use cases, which uh, sort of grant the domain model life. It allows users to uh, perform actions on the domain model and change its state and uh, ask questions about it. And on the very outside, we have the UI, which uh, can be anything from a web page to a PDF document to an email that is being sent to the users. Uh, and this model can apply whether you use Hanami or you use Rails. Uh, it's just the implementation details that differ. And when I talk about the model, I, I'm specifically referring to the inner parts, uh, the core, and in here, we sort of try to model the universe of our users, which 
uh, is the HR professionals. We're trying to model uh, organizations and employee hier hierarchies and, and such. And I will talk about uh, two properties of our model that we are trying to aspire to uh, in order to deal with the information complexity that we have in the product. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about accuracy and I will talk a little bit about robustness. Uh, but I would like to start with a disclaimer. So I will be outlining a lot of tactics in this talk that we have adopted because they solve specific problems that we have encountered in building engaged rockets. Uh, but please be mindful that it doesn't mean that you should go and apply all of them in your own project. Uh, always start with a problem first. And maybe some of the solutions that I present today can help you out. So when I say accuracy, I'm talking about uh, how well the domain model maps to the universe of our users. Uh, not necessarily in the sense that it models perfectly the physical world. Um, I think the world is a bit too fuzzy for that to be feasible. And a lot of times we're solving human problems which uh, tend not to be constrained by reasoning or, or logic. Uh, when talking to business users, you will also often hear different stories about what the, uh, their domain looks like or how their systems work. So an accurate model to me uh, is one that supports the use cases that uh, solve problems for users. And ideally it should do that with the lowest amount of complexity possible. Uh, more than that, I think an accurate model can sometimes help us find the real problems. It can often be hard to get to the real problem when talking to a user. They might start by presenting you with their in imagined solution or they might give you uh, an XY problem. Uh, and to frame the talk on accuracy, I would like to ask a question. Uh, how much deliberation should we put into a given technical decision? Is it 10 minutes? Is it one week? And as with many hard questions, the answer is that uh, it depends. And I would like to say that it depends on the cost of reverting or uh, revising this decision later on. Uh, or in short, the amount of deliberation should uh, be proportional to the cost of change. If we put too much deliberation into unimportant decisions, uh, we'll be ineffectively spending our time and energy and we'll end up with a, a bike shed. If we put uh, not enough deliberation into very important decisions, and this happens a lot, because we might be too delivery focused. Uh, then we are on a death march to uh, an app that will eventually calcify and resist any future changes. So knowing that, we need to ask ourselves, what is costly to change in a Rails app in our case? Uh, and particularly one with live users and a lot of live data. And Generally, changing the data model is not only expensive, but it can also be uh, anxiety-inducing. So to change the data model, we probably need migrations to uh, describe the changes to our uh, database. We might need to rebuild some of the database uh, indices. Uh, we might need strategies for backfilling data that we haven't captured in the previous data model. Uh, we might need to use multi-phase deploys to migrate user data to a new column and in a subsequent deploy remove the old column. Uh, and we might need to fiddle around in the console in, with our production data, uh, usually late at night or on a weekend when our users are not uh, active. So it's not a very nice place to be. Uh, and anecdotally, it seems like the cost of change increases the closer we get to the heart of our application. Part of this is the implication of dealing with live data, uh, but also a problem in our data or domain model uh, tends to have implications for our use cases and UI. So amending them usually means amending the use cases and UI, which compounds the cost. So it's, it seems natural then that we should spend some amount of time and effort on getting our 
data and domain model right. And one good way to get started is to create uh, an entity relationship diagram, uh, which is a complicated name for a uh, boxes and arrows diagram. So a full ERD would contain the names of the entities and it would have some cross feeds to uh, indicate one to many relationships. Uh, and ERD is a good way of offloading our working memory as well. Uh, as developers, we're very good at complaining about distractions, uh, but this is something we can actually do to uh, increase, our, increase the robustness of our personal workflow by taking away the amount of things I need to keep in my working memory. And it's much more pleasant to have a document that I can look at rather than going to uh, every single Ruby file looking at the associations and trying to memorize what the domain model is. It can also be a great artifact to have when uh, we have dis design discussions. So just like how business users can have different ideas of what the domain looks like or how the system works, uh, this can happen to developers as well. It's very helpful to have one document to look at and point at together for a shared context. Because ERDs are diagrams, it's, there are also some things that we can visually identify by just looking at the diagram. So if we look at the left side of our diagram, it all looks quite neat and simple and easy to comprehend. Uh, if we look at the other side, we might or might not have cause for concern. There are some uh, circular references and uh, entities that have a lot of connections to other things. This can be a way to identify a problem area in your app where you might uh, be able to identify and extract some domain concept that you were previously unaware of. Or it could just be necessary complexity for your app. So again, we need to use our own uh, sound judgment for this. Uh, we can also use the visual nature of the diagram to uh, help identify module boundaries. So in our example, we had two sort of islands of entities that are connected by a very uh, simple bridge. Uh, this could indicate that we're dealing with two unrelated parts of the uh, domain. If we want to maintain this relationship simple, which is uh, often desirable, we can do things like namespace our models, or we can extract Rails Engine, which Wei Liang has talked about uh, in a previous talk. Sometimes these islands are uh, also completely disjoint, so there's no connection between them. It makes it very easy to see uh, that your app has different apps inside. Uh, if you want to get started with uh, ERDs, you can use the Rails ERD gem. Uh, it works out of the box and it generates good enough diagrams for most apps, I would say. And it also comes with rake tasks, so you can automate this uh, as part of your build process. And it will essentially put a PDF file in your repo, which you can use for the current ERD. Uh, in EngageRocket, we like to keep our use cases away from our uh, domain objects. Uh, when not doing this, we found that the domain objects have a tendency to get uh, overly specific and coupled to the use cases. Uh, and disparate concepts have a tendency to get fused together into uh, fewer records. And this usually only lets us fit so many use cases until the use cases start to conflict with each other, whether it's through uh, callbacks or conditional validations or otherwise. But this is not the only way of uh, building Rails apps. Uh, for us, we found it helpful to use service objects for use cases and uh, presenters to avoid the problem that Gregor was talking about of having uh, fat views or UIs with a lot of logic in them. So we currently have uh, 81 service objects and I think 14 presenters for complex UI elements. And being able to reason about this and test them in isolation has been useful for us. Uh, 
As a bonus, I think it makes our code base quite discoverable. If you need to figure out what the app can do, you can go into the services directory and you can look at the names of the services and instantly figure out anything the user can do. Uh, or if you need to work on the calendar widget, you can go to the calendar presenter and start working. But there, there are other ways of building Rails apps that uh, are conducive to other constraints. Uh, so DHH has a video series online where he outlines how he builds uh, Basecamp. And the approach he takes is different from this one. He uses a lot of callbacks and he uh, doesn't make the clear distinction between framework and application and uh, model and business logic. Uh, so uh, what I would recommend is uh, go visit the, those videos. You can look at the video I made uh, a few years ago about the beyond the MVC on the extended object taxonomy we're using. Uh, then you can look at your own problem and you can shop from your list of solutions. Another tactic is don't lose your data. Uh, <laughs> we had a new fe feature request last week, which uh, on the surface seemed like a relatively straightforward one. Uh, to illustrate, I need to explain what a 360 review is. Essentially, you ask your, your team members to review you, and you review yourself, and then you compare the results between you and your team. Your reviewers can be assigned either by yourself or by an admin or someone with the rights to do so. This requirement said that in the email we send to the participant, we want one list of the reviewers that they added and one list of the reviewers that were added by someone else. Straightforward, except we didn't have the data in our data model. Uh, basically, we're missing a reference uh, to the user who made the assignment. And in this case, it was a complete oversight on our end. Uh, it had not really surfaced in our design discussions. And until this rogue requirement that came much later, we uh, didn't really rely on this piece of data for anything else. Because we cannot reliably determine the assigner uh, post factum, we had to sit down and create some rules for backfilling the data. This doesn't have a huge impact on our existing users because it affects mostly uh, historical uh, reviews, which are no longer sending out these emails. Uh, but it did probably require more engineering effort than it would have uh, taken to put this data in from the beginning. And it also impacts our internal data analysis a little bit. Great, we have established how to create an accurate domain model, uh, one that clearly reflects the domain we're working with, uh, without getting too intimate with uh, specific use cases. And we also have some handy diagrams to look at uh, to inspect it. But even now, we need to ensure the integrity of our domain model. It doesn't really matter how accurate it is if we still get nonsensical or invalid data stored inside the domain model. So I would like to present you with a very non-hypothetical scenario. Uh, imagine you are on duty, you're monitoring Sentry, uh, you experience some issue, you start looking into it and you find a no method error in one of the views. What do you do? And actually, this is how we discovered a lot of problems with our domain and data model. So a suggestion could be that, oh, we, we had a nil check in the view, and that's it, right? It only takes about 30 seconds, which is pretty good compared to, say, a seven-day SLA. And the ROI seems through the roof, because uh, 30 seconds is a very short amount of time. But the answer is no, because the problem is not that we needed a nil check in the view. Uh, there was a problem with our domain model and fixing it in the UI is directly counterproductive. Because a problem with our domain model probably have much more far reaching consequences than just a view breaking. And we're sort of patching this over and waiting for the next thing to break. 
And by fixing the proximal cause, which was in the view, we're actually adding complexity to the outer layers of the app, which is there only to account for things that shouldn't happen in the first place. But I do see uh, really good engineers following this chat all the time. And we actually know why it is so tempting based on one of our previous slides. And that is because it's super cheap to fix it in the view. Uh, I can just click that uh, uh, finish button in Pivotal Tracker and get my fix of dopamine for the day. Uh, but we're really playing in the immediate term by doing this. And as professional developers, we need to play in the long term. We need to uh, play with the team. Uh, so what we should do is we should find a real problem, add a regression test for it, fix it, and then submit the PR. Uh, but luckily, there are a few ways we can increase the robustness of the domain model. And I think the first and most important one is to establish some invariance. So what is an invariant? It is a fancy word for saying a condition that we can assume be true during runtime. So it's just something we assume to be there. This is also the hardest one because it's conceptual work. You need to think about the product. You need to think about the code base at runtime. Uh, and it normally requires some collaboration with the product owner. Sometimes we do establish invariance without being aware of it. And a large portion of our application ends up uh, resting on this one assumption. This can be very dangerous uh, because there might be an emerging requirement that contradicts this invariant. And undoing it might unwind the entire application and cause a lot of uh, issues down the line. So invariants can be conceptual. This usually means they are explicit in the product and the domain itself. So I have some very contrived examples. Uh, we can say that an employee must have exactly one direct manager. So this is something we can decide together with the product owner. Uh, by saying this, we don't have to account for the case where an employee is orphaned, has no manager. Uh, we don't need to account for the case where there are more than one direct manager. So this can greatly simplify the, the complexity of the use cases. Uh, but invariance can also be established by developers alone in the implementation details. This is normally not explicit in the product, so it's something we can do under the hood without affecting the user uh, experience. And it can still help simplify use cases and UIs. So, for example, in an app where we have users, some of them have accounts, some do not, we could if it simplifies our application, decide that, okay, everyone has an account, but the users who don't have access, they have locked accounts. Now the invariance we have established is there's always an account there, which helps simplify the logic a bit. Or we could use a, a null object to say that there will always be a current user, whether they are signed in or not. So instead of always checking for the presence of a, presence of a user, we can check uh, whether the current user is signed in or not, uh, which is conceptually easier to understand. Uh, but probably the most straightforward thing we can do is to use the facilities that are already provided in Rails for ensuring the data integrity. Uh, and the most common and low-hanging fruit is to use validations. In Rails 5, belongs to associations have uh, presence validations by default, which helps uh, keep our domain model somewhat intact. So in the example, we're using some Rails validations together with a custom email format validator. And we recently had a, a problem where some emails had uh, non-UTF blank space characters inside. And we think this was happening because users were copying emails from another app and it copied some strange uh, characters with it. Uh, this caused some problems for us. So we also added an email sanitizer that could take care of this. Uh, 
Uh, for records which can be destroyed, it's usually a good idea to uh, establish some uh, dependent strategies uh, that tell us what will happen to associated records when we destroy the parent record. Uh, this forces us to think about the domain model. How should it actually work? What are the implications? And it also gives us some automatic treatment of associated records. And the most familiar and common strategy is destroy. So whenever we destroy a reviewer, we also destroy their assignments, avoiding uh, orphan records in our database. Another useful but maybe less known strategy is restrict with error. Uh, this will add an active record error to the parent object if there are associated records when you try to destroy it. Another good tactic is to use state machines. Uh, if you have some complex record that is part of a workflow, then it might be a good candidate for a state machine. A common indicator is that you have an, uh, a Rails enum on it that says status. Uh, and a state machine helps avoid invalid uh, transitions and invalid uh, data states by having us declare all the possibilities up front. We can also do things like guards for uh, more advanced checks on transitions, and we can uh, add some hooks to update some timestamps. And in the example, I'm using the AASM, which is uh, very comprehensive and well documented, and I think actively maintained. So, highly recommended. If we need to, we can use some database level constraints to enforce uh, integrity. You may or may not need this in your applications. I think the official Rails guide says you won't need it, uh, but it really depends on what kind of problems you encounter. Where is your data coming from? Are you copying uh, from other databases? Are you uh, importing from other places? Are you using methods that bypass validations, like uh, bulk update, bulk insert. Uh, in our case, we encountered at least a few uh, places where this would otherwise have inserted invalid data into our database. So we find it somewhat useful. Uh, so we can add null constraints to mi mimic the validate presence in Rails. Uh, we can provide defaults where they make sense. So in the example of migration, we are adding an enum column to projects. Uh, it doesn't make sense for us to have projects without a status, so we don't allow it to be null. Uh, and all new projects are pending, so we also add that as a default in our case. Uh, we can use unique uh, indices to mimic the uniqueness validations of Rails. Uh, so in this migration, we're adding a unique index to ensure that no two users have the same email. Uh, we can use the foreign key constraints to ensure referential integrity to our uh, belongs to associations. So here we are adding a company reference to the projects table. And by using the foreign key constraints, the database will ensure that no project can point to a company ID that doesn't exist because the database will raise an error. If you're a power user and have a need for it, you can use uh, check constraints, which are provided by Postgres. Uh, you can essentially get this to mimic any validation that you would do in Rails, as long as the data is on the table itself. So in the example, we're adding a constraint to the projects table to make sure that uh, no project has an end date that is before the start date. And if you want to remove a constraint, you can just refer to it by its name after it's been created. There is one caveat to using uh, check constraints. Uh, in order for the schema to be able to store uh, information about it, you need to migrate your schema to uh, SQL format. The Ruby formats uh, does not support check constraints. So to summarize, 
mind your model. Uh, mind is the more important part. Always start with a problem. Uh, be mindful of your model. Changing it down the line might be very expensive or uh, in some cases impossible. Thank you. Mouse pads for questions. Yes. So you mentioned using database constraints, but then if you're using database constraints and application constraints, then you need to keep them synchronized all the time. If you don't use database constraints, then someone can put invalid data. If you keep only database constraints but not application, then you, you get certain cryptic error from the database if you try to put invalid data. So how do you deal with that? You can also not use constraints at all, but probably that's the worst solution. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, the way I've approached it is sort of a pick your poison approach. Huh? Uh, I use both. Like how do you ensure that you've got them synchronized? You just try. I, I ensure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I think there are some tools that attempt to solve this, mm -hmm. but I don't think any of them have worked when I've tried them some tools that can automatically translate your uh, model validations into database constraints. Mm -hmm. This might also be one of the reasons why the Rails guys recommend just using the model validations. Yeah. Because if you don't need the database constraints, it's a n unnecessary overhead. But it's the unique validation there, right? Because you want something to be unique and and you validate it before inserting the database, you might just both you might put two the same records, try to put the same records, right? So then the unique validation might pass in the application because at the time there there is unique and in the database it will pass because you don't put the validation and then you've got invalid data that passed past your validation, right? Yes. Uniqueness validations can also cause problems with things like sorting, like if you keep a sort index on your records and you try to re reorder the records, mm -hmm. you might bump into some uh, uniqueness index problem as well. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes? Okay. Sorry, it sounds like both of your applications are, are, more, are, more, are more like a web application. Right? I'm a, I, I use uh, SketchUp very extensively, and I, I know that uh, in SketchUp, right, you can create extensions with uh, Ruby. So, I don't know. Uh, does does whatever, whatever you guys mentioned right, apply to SketchUp as well? Because I totally don't know anything about uh, Ruby at all. What is SketchUp? Uh, it's so a 3 d modeling software that's, uh, that's from Google, but I got modeled by Triple. You can use it for like uh, 3D mod modeling of uh, buildings. You can use it to create like a... Uh, uh, you can use it for 3D printing, virtual reality. So they have they have a uh, extension warehouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, the extension warehouse, right? Uh, all the applications... Are uh, coded using Ruby. Okay. Yeah, but uh, I don't know whether Hanami or whatever you just mentioned would apply. I, I don't really know what the scope uh, of or extent of a SketchUp uh, extension is, uh, but I have a feeling that the part that applies is the use your mind part. <laughs> I, I think the rest uh, uh, is more specific to application development, so uh, yes, mostly web apps. Right, I'll hand over to William. Thank you very much.